Uh, but unfortunately, in the 1970s, um, the, the miracle drug for hemophiliacs, which is called Factor, um, was also made of human blood and therefore mm -hmm. contaminated. This was before the days of heat treatment and other things that protect now the blood supply and blood products. And, and that's how I became HIV positive. Uh, and, and in fact, I tell people that uh, over 90% of all hemophiliacs of my generation tested HIV positive because, we of, didn't know. because of the medicine, yes. We didn't know. Now, I mean, I'm sure Jim tomorrow will track the, your life tracks the whole medical history of HIV AIDS treatment. Yes, yes. You've survived our learning curve on this we disease. Have. Yeah, we have. Uh, but let's start with a happy story. Okay. A busy bus. A busy no bus. No seats left. <laughs> Full bus, that's right. What and, happened, Pokey? Um, well, and I was running late, which I've been late a few we were times. In high there you go. We were in high school. We were in high school, um, and we were both in leadership positions in lots of different high school activities. I was running late, and the director called and said, just get on a bus. We're leaving. And so I threw my luggage in the back, and I opened the door, and I sat down, and I sat in Shane's lap. And he went, um, this is not a seat. <laughs> The, Shane is a tightly wound little man, <laughs> um, and I was not. I was the high school mascot and cheerleader and just whatever fun was happening, I was probably there. Shane was in the library. I'm a rules follower, and therefore they said, this is where you sit, and there were no more seats. And Pokey said, well, I'm sitting here. And I thought, well, okay. Now, secretly, I was like, yes, because she, <laughs> you know, cute girl sitting in my lap. I thought, oh, this is great, but so, had to protest. I sat in his lap, and that was kind of the beginning sure. of us, so to speak, the entire trip. Yeah. And you were still so very young yeah. when you got this diagnosis, devastating on so many levels. Your faith was so strong, having carried oh, more pain. What did I write down your quote? Growing up in pain taught me a lot about how much of this world I can't control. Mm. I mean, that was a young lesson. Mm. But then the HIV, and that was, that was a different deal. Yeah. That was so. I had had eye, I had had eye surgery the year before the diagnosis, uh, and it was at actually the during the eye surgery process that they tested me. They were so concerned though about the fact that there were no medicines at the time. There was really it was a death sentence, and so they they did not tell me for seven months. Uh, they wanted me to heal from the eye surgery. Uh, during those seven months, I tell people, you know, I was the captain of the golf team and president of my class and dating the prettiest girl in school. And the, and the next day was told that, um, that I had two to three years to live. And it was, it was a, a tremendously dramatic, traumatic uh, diagnosis because there was nothing that you could do about it mm -hmm. at the time. And, and that really led to a conversation with my grandfather that, that changed my life. That, now your parents that had divorced they had when you were what, six? Six years old. And your grandpa really became your hero, your mentor. He did, he friend. did. Just a wonderful man. He was a, a simple man. He was a farmer um, who loved the land and he loved the Lord and um, had these nuggets of wisdom that he would share. And I can remember just a few weeks after after the diagnosis, he uh, was. We were sitting. We had a special place that we would go on Sunday mornings, just before we would go to church, and you know, it had an orchard, and 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 so it was just a, a nice time for us to be together. And uh, he looked over at me and said, "You know, what are you going to do with this thing?" And um, and that was his quote. He didn't even use the letters HIV. And I I looked back and I said, "I don't I don't think I have a choice." And he said, "Son, you always have a choice." You can get in the corner and feel sorry for yourself. And he said, I love you so much that if that's the choice you make, I'll get in the corner with you and we'll have that pity party. But he said, I think you're gonna make another choice. I think you're gonna make every day count. And that's what we've tried to do. Wow, that's really your banner mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm, yeah. As a is. couple, as a family, we will discover. Um, telling Pokey was probably the mm. hardest part of this. It was because at 16, and especially in the late 80s or mid 80s, you just assumed that everyone who knew was going to reject you. Uh, we had heard the stories of uh, Ryan White and Ricky Ray and others who 
were not allowed to go to school or church or, or be involved in community activities. But I knew that uh, being together that, we, that she deserved to know. And now we were blessed, and we say this everywhere we go, we had been a part of a program called True Love Waits at our local churches. And therefore we had... Was that we, Josh McDowell? I, th I think it, yeah, I think it so. was, yes. Yeah, so. And so we had, just had made choices about being intimate, that we were not going to be intimate before marriage. And, and, and those were very important to our faith. And it actually probably saved her life because we didn't know about the, the condition. Exactly. But I just assumed that as soon as I told her that she would um, politely, you now she was always very sweet and polite, but that she would back out of the relationship. And I, I'll never forget the day she was sitting in my lap and, uh, and when, she, uh, when I told her, um, she, uh, she looked at me and she said, well, there's some things I need to share with you. And I did not know that she had been through so many different wounds in her own life with some broken uh, promises from people who were supposed to take care of her and watch over her. And so we realized that we were kind of two broken souls that God had put together and, um, and we were gonna make this journey uh, as, a, as a team. Pokey, was that? admission uh, somewhat cathartic for you? It opened yeah, a door, it I seems. I think so. Um, I think, too, we realized that God had placed us together as soulmates mm -hmm. and that, you know, our journeys, although we didn't know what they were, and I have to say, you know, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> HIV, I, we didn't know enough really to be scared, except that it meant he would die soon, sooner rather than later. Sure. Is that what you thought? Yeah, Did absolutely. you think you might just have two or three years with this man? Oh, yeah. We, we did, yes. We, uh, that's why we got married at 19. I tell people as the father of three daughters now, I would never condone getting married that young for my <laughs> daughters. But we really didn't know how long we had. And so um, we just kind of naively and blindly, I think, just trusted God and said, mm. okay, wherever you go, that's where we go. Mm. Wow. This is a great story already. Oh, thank you. And these are the very early chapters, <laughs> yes. the very early chapters. Pokey, you said, we learned to make life matter instead of just letting life go when it got too hard. A lot of hard things. I mean, I got lost in the, the, the treatments and the, the down places and the mm. feeling like you had flu every day and yeah. just a lot of really rough chapters. And that's before you even get to the church. Yes. And what were they going to do about a man who had chosen to serve God with his life? That's right. We, we had so many things that, um, that we had to face that no one really talked about when the diagnosis was mentioned. You know, every day is, is a struggle for those who are HIV positive, even if you have great medicines, because the medicines are so powerful. And so you do feel like you have the flu pretty much uh, all the time. Uh,